I'm delighted and honoured to be in the position of putting a few questions or comments to the the, the, the two uh, the, the, the two people who put such a, a terrific contribution in today. And I wonder if we can start with perhaps the most difficult bit, and it perhaps goes back to to Joyce this morning talking about. I can't remember the exact phrase, but basically rebelling against austerity. Um, I think, you know, what, 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 what's behind this? And some people have made the point during the day that, you know, the festivals are not responsible for Airbnb, and that's being addressed through an, another angle. And the festivals are not responsible for um, the implementation of planning permissions or the way the property market works and so on. But... Um, there does for all this seem to be a chain between austerity, tourism, the need, the need to boost tourism, and the role of the festivals and the cultural industries in contributing to that. And uh, my question then is, do you think we can break that chain? Do you think there is, at the moment, picking up one of the questions we had during the day, do you think there is over tourism in Edinburgh and that to address over tourism, some action needs to be taken in relation to the festival's offer of the city. Um, shall I start since you, you um, I give Stephen a rest? Um, 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 yeah, um, I think there is over tourism in Edinburgh. There's certainly a very strong perception of over tourism. And I think as, as someone said in, in one of the sessions this afternoon, I'm sorry, I can't remember who, it's, it's mainly a question of particularly sort of poor coping mechanisms for the very, very high levels of visitors that we have in August, um, combined with a kind of rush towards the commercialization of Christmas and New Year to try and uh, sort of boost the city's economy at that time of year, which has resulted, I think, in some actually aesthetically and and sort of morally question kind of morally in the in the biggest sense i don't mean you know that people have been behaving with great turpitude or anything but um you know that kind of questions that sort of taint the reputation of the city as a beautiful city and as a city of a certain cultural stature you know some of the things that have been permitted you know sort of the big sort of whizzing sort of you know giant um chero plane thing beside beside the scott monument and all that are I mean, they're fun and they're spectacular, and but they're very expensive to use. They exclude a lot of people from the point of view of cost. Um, and they, they're quite ugly, particularly during the daytime. They just wreck the view, you know. Um, and things like that, um, I think, ha have uh, resulted really from very strong commercial pressure on cities to generate money by any means available. And obviously, tourism is, is a, a means available, or was before the COVID crisis, a means available um, to Edinburgh. Um, and I think underlying a lot of the issues we've been discussing today, including the questions that have been raised about exactly whose job is it to kind of lead on these issues and to bring all these issues together and do something about it, apart from the Coburn Association, which always does a, a very valuable job, of, of course, but you really do need a city leadership with the clout to do this now. And although I don't think it's exactly deliberate, either on the part of the UK government or of the Scottish government, I think the cumulative effect of funding cuts and reorganizations on local government over the last 40 years in the UK more generally and in Scotland has been to really weaken local authorities to the point where they are struggling to play any kind of creative role in this. It's not that they don't want to, it's not that they don't have a, a lot of good quality policy ideas and consultations floating about, it's that they lack the wiggle room, the financial clout, the budget options um, to be able to, to, um, to um, intervene in, in the cultural and in the, or in the balance, if you like, between the cultural and commercial life of the city in the way that they could um, in the 1980s when I was starting out as a young arts commentator and of course very much admiring what was going on in Glasgow in the way of the use of culture to build that up and of course at that time there was also the regional um, local government structure in Scotland which was also very very strong and had a huge input put to the Glasgow 1990 process. So local government has changed a lot and I don't think we can underestimate the importance of that in, um, in, in what happens in our cities. Now 
it's a tall order to say that we need to have a, a total uh, local government reform, although many people in Scotland have been arguing that for years. The great Leslie Riddle has written whole books about it and the extent to which we need better local government in this country to really make the place thrive and blossom. But I've got a sinking feeling that unless that problem is tackled sooner or later, then a lot of these issues um, will continue to kind of fester. And of course, uh, democracy, a local democracy is the basic building block of all democracy. You know, we've got people in the timeline here just saying, well, look, how do we know that the Edinburgh Council reflects the views of Edinburgh citizens? And that's how bad it's got. You know, we all have the chance to elect them, but nobody, you know, very few people seem to feel that they really speak for us. And, you know, what, what is that all about? It's partly about their powerlessness and it's partly about the political structures within which um, they operate. And it really is a bit of a crisis. Everyone says that Edinburgh's uh, uh, Scotland's local authorities are both too big and too small. They're too small to be really community, uh, too big to be really community based, and they're too small um, to really have a powerful strategic role. And um, so that's a really serious problem. And I think although we can't change it overnight, I think we have to keep it in, the, in our minds. And I think we also have to think very creatively about the way in which civic organisations like the Coburn and, and dozens of others can try and step into that role and actually not so much criticise the council but support the council in trying to at least do what it can with the resources that it has which are pretty limited. I just, just mentioned in passing because somebody did raise it in the questions that we did invite the uh, festivals champion of the councillors festivals champion for the city to take part in the event but um, as you can see that they're not here so Stephen uh, do, do you think we can break this chain? Well I mean I think what you've just said, Cliff, sum, sums up fundamentally the problem. I would agree with absolutely everything that, that Joyce said there. But you know, here is here's a ready-made, as Boris would love to say, an oven-ready opportunity for the council to engage with the people who really care about these issues, and they've chosen not to do it this afternoon. I think part of the issue has become, and we saw it really uh, very strongly at the City for Sale event last year, was there's a real them and us has developed between the council who feel their backs are against the wall when it comes to the festival and cultural life in Edinburgh. And those of us out here who are really keen to engage with them, you know, some of the brilliant sessions that Joyce did this morning, I mean, the, the voices are there who want to positively engage. And that last session we did on carbon as well, we're all very happy to have an open conversation. We would love the council to be part of this discussion. One of these boxes on the screen to be a council representative, but, you know, all, we, all you can do is offer the opportunity and offer the platform and somehow we need to find a way of making them feel that they're able to do that. My personal view is that we do need an, a directly elected Lord Provost for the City of Edinburgh. Something needs to change. Local government has changed, as Joyce says, but the festivals have changed as well. And I think part of the issue that we have now is some of the very big festival operators, and we all know who they are, the council are legally scared of challenging them. And that's why we got into that mess with uh, Princess Street Gardens and the Winter Festival last year. And we somehow need to step back from the brink in all of this and, and get a proper dialogue going between Coburn Association, interested parties in, in Edinburgh, environmental groups and the council, because I, I just think they are scared and reluctant potentially for legal reasons of openly engaging with us. I think it was interesting to hear Joyce talking quite a bit about the winter festivals. I agree, I think we do have over tourism in Edinburgh. And my sense of it is just that we, all of us who live and care about the city have a threshold. And it, it, August was working fine. It was getting big and it was getting busy, but we needed some fallow period in the year when we could catch our breath and enjoy the city for what it is. And winter was that. And then, then along came the juggernaut of the winter festivals. And I, I'm old enough to remember when I first came to university in Edinburgh, walking down the mound and watching the Lord Provost switch on the Christmas tree at the mound, which probably was what happened in December, just gone. And that was more or less it. Now, I'm not saying we should go back to those Spartan days in Edinburgh. But it's completely out of control what is happening in the city now in December. The numbers of people, the impact, the drinking that goes on. And for me, the winter festivals are just the straw that breaks the camel's back when it comes to the goodwill of people in the city. 
Or just following that, should we scrap the Winter Festival? I, I think not. I can remember when they first started and you see the council had more money to put into them. So they were able to commission a, a, a producer um, um, in, in, in that particular case, Pete Irvin, who was, who was able to include a lot of Scottish creative input into the texture of the early winter festivals. And actually it was great. I mean, if you remember when they first did the thing of, of funding the, the museums and galleries and things to open up, on New Year's Day, when it, you, the whole place used to be dead, it was wonderful, you know. So I think that the, the idea of having a, a, a kind of special hogmanay in Edinburgh and encouraging people to visit at that time, there's nothing wrong with it. But the thing is that in pursuit of the dosh and the desperation to get deals with commercial organisations that can take the financial weight, the council has just gone right over the top and created something that most Edinburgh citizens find embarrassing, to be honest. You know, I think. I would too, I would just have given Peter Irvin the job permanently, Joyce, of managing the winter festivals because he did it in a way that was respectful of the city. But as soon as it gets into tendering process, as soon as it gets into the lawyers, and as soon as it gets into London arts organisations seeing uh, revenue for them at other times of the year than August, that was always going to be uh, out, of the game, out of the game, out of the possibility. And I, 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 for one, I would scrap, in their current form, I would scrap the winter festivals. We need to go back to what they originally were. And, you know, the discussion you know, where we started off with the cultural fabric of the city as it exists the rest of the year and what makes us a World Heritage Site. I mean, no one looks at the buildings in Edinburgh. No one looks at the stuff that you protect, Cliff, during the winter festivals. There's just this, you know, rush to put up as much temporary infrastructure as you can squeeze as much money out. Joyce, on you go. Yeah, but you, 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 the trouble is you can't totally generalise. Like last year, the, the message from the skies thing was absolutely brilliant, which was in association with the Hogmanay Festival and the Book Festival. It was programmed by Nick Barley. And that was the thing where they, they projected, the, the theme was Shores and Coastlines, which is the Scottish government's theme this year. And that's where they projected um, words and vi video images and sound um, onto really important buildings in Edinburgh and you could walk around you know at dusk or after dark and see them you know the the, the Nelson Monument on Colton Hill the lighthouse place in George Street um, down at, at, at Leith Docks um, um, you know and that was absolutely magical just throwing light on buildings that you didn't normally um, look at, you know, so it's not that nothing good happens, you know, and that happened under the aegis of the underbelly, who take a lot of stick, but are actually a very complicated organisation who run these big commercial events and make money out of them, but also put a lot of money um, uh, from that back into sponsoring sort of small scale theatre and stuff. You know, I'm the woman who sits in the, in the underbelly during the fringe watching the new drama that they sponsor and seeing Phoebe Waller Bridge doing Fleabag before anybody's ever heard of her. And all that is done. Down to underbelly, as well as the sort of grotesque commercial um, stuff that, we, that we've seen um, over Christmas. So it's actually a very, very complicated scene. And I don't think any of the people involved in it are actually ill-intentioned. Ill it's just that the weakness of the council, their inability to regulate and their desperation for cash has made them vulnerable to having operations which are just not really appropriate. And of course, where the commercial opportunity for those operations is there, people, someone, you know, whether it's Underbelly or someone else is going to take that opportunity, you know? Can I just move us on because time is quite tight and uh, there's still I think, other things that we haven't touched upon, which came through quite strongly. And one is the, the geography of the, the events, the, the concentration in the city centre, which people have said is quite a small area. And of course the knock-on effects that that has had. But equally, you know, we, we've been told that you know, that there's a sort of functional need in a sense for proximity of a number of these events that, and I'm sure we've all done it where, you know, you, you're trying to, to rush from one event to the next in the five minutes you've got, and it's, you're, you're okay unless you're a tourist and find that the place you've got to go to or it looks next to you on the map is actually a hundred feet below you and you've got to go right the way round and down to get there. So do you think it's possible to decentralize and can that be linked to the other big theme I think in the morning about community engagement and growing uh, arts and culture as an empowering force in the life of all citizens. 
Yeah, well, Joyce knows more about this than me, but I, I would just say absolutely, it is the only way forward. I mean, I, I live in the north of Edinburgh, down by the sea in New Haven. Uh, you know, if, if I choose to stay here for the three weeks in August, I would have no idea there is a festival taking place in Edinburgh. There's no sense of it at all down here. It has no impact on it, apart from people who want a day off the festival and come down to mooch around New Haven Harbour. We absolutely do need to involve community arts organisations. We need to involve venues down here. You know, we need to work at a huge cost. We are getting the trams down here. So, you know, for goodness sake, let's look at every mechanism to get people moving around the city in a sustainable way. Um, to use the facilities that are already here. We cannot continue with this concentration in the city centre. It's just unworkable and unfeasible. Joyce. Yeah, I think the Fringe Administration agrees with you and has been looking into ways of trying to, in fact, they have made some small resources available. I think the Fringe, um, well, when they had the money to do it, they lost their uh, Creative Scotland funding a couple of years ago, but they, they were making some money available to do something like a little local brochure for one or two areas of Edinburgh saying this is what your fringe stuff that's that's on in Leith or this is your fringe stuff that's on in Gorgie you know um kind of kind of little um informational things to encourage people to attend events in their own um locality but frankly I don't think there's really enough to make that work I mean the concentration around the university area raises all sorts of questions. I mean, I was glad to hear that the role of the university um, and came to the fore in the discussion about, um, about um, the environment, you know, the, the climate change um, agenda and the, the, the carbon footprint of the fringe because the university is the kind of big organization that can play a really major positive um, role in that. And, you know, the univer without the university um, venues and, and spaces, obviously, it would be very hard for the fringe to happen at all. But the concentration in that university area has become extraordinary. But I don't think, I think only money, sadly, or only some kind of, you know, a stream of resources available will make it possible to try and reverse that. You would need to kind of, at least for a few years, seriously subsidise fringe events taking place and over a wider geography. But I mean, uh, the, the sort of centripetal force of the fringe is fantastic. People love being in that throbbing hub of it, you know. And I was busy lamenting this week the, the departure of um, the book festival from Charlotte Square because I thought the book festival in Charlotte Square was beautiful and it kept George Street and the new town alive as a sort of, you know, living part of the festival with the assembly rooms being sort of less of a centre than it used to be and St Stephen's Church is closed and, you know, most of the new town venues no longer exist basically. Um, and I was, I was saying what, how sad, you know, no more book festivals in Charlotte Square, but other people were celebrating. People connected with the book festival were saying, but look, we'll be right next to the BBC hub at Harriet's School, we'll be right next to the dance space, we'll be right next to, you know, people really want to be in that, in that sort of central bit of the festival. So it really is a complicated issue. And I think only a kind of well-placed bit of subsidy would really, and, and, and some concentration on the attraction of localities like Leith, like Stockbridge, like Gorgie Dal Rai, like, you know, the canal area around Fountain Bridge, uh, the attractiveness of those localities with a little bit of money behind it might help the fringe to begin to di diversify again. But, George, you know, George, it's right touch and go. Sorry to interrupt, I'm not right in thinking we've retreated from where we used to be. I mean, I can remember going to festival events down at Ocean Terminal. I can remember yeah. the fringe events down there. I can remember going to things in Granton. They just don't seem to exist anymore. There's been a retreat. Actually, it's not like we're trying to get out into these areas. We were in these areas with the fringe. Yeah, and we pull back into this hub. Oh yeah, I mean, as Tom Dibden said in the comment earlier on, when I first started reviewing the Fringe, it was in a far wider range of places. I mean, I'd be going into the depths of Morningside to watch things in church halls. And although some of those things were Edinburgh amateur companies who do still tend to appear in a wider range of geographical locations, some of them weren't. I mean, you know, I remember seeing international work in church halls away down the south side or the north side, you know, and, and that just, seemingly doesn't happen anymore. Perhaps it's the intensely competitive nature of the fringe now that it's so big that people just feel they need the competitive advantage of being very close to the centre of things. Otherwise, they just don't have a hope. 
of selling the ticket sales that they need to, to kind of either to publicize their work, leaving the, the money aside, or to, to kind of minimize their financial losses, because certainly very few of them will be making any financial gains, that's for sure. I'm talking about the performing companies now and not the promoters. Yeah. Is planning a big part of this, do, do we think? Because when you look, look at something like George, George Square, you know, it's now grown from some fringe operations to the jazz festivals there. And then the Edinburgh Food Festival was created because they're throwing the infrastructure in. They're putting these giant super bars in there. Um, and they need to make that work over the course of a longer period. So you've now got from what, end of June, basically, infrastructure and build in there until... September. So of course they're going to cram as many shows in there. So do we need to look at how planning interacts with that and say, actually, that's that's too long and that's too big. You need to go elsewhere to do some of your stuff. Yeah, but that that would require the kind of confidence from the council that doesn't seem to be there. I mean, I, I know that people think that you know, it, 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 it sounds as if it, it's sort of blaming the council for everything. But the fact is, when you've got an event as big as the Edinburgh Festival and you've got a municipal authority which is lacking the, the kind of resources and clout to really stand up to and negotiate as an equal with some of these big commercial operators, it really is a problem. And it's something that can only be addressed by a, a, a serious reform in Scotland, I think. And if you look at uh, Glasgow City Council now, just to sort of change the focus slightly, you know, kind of struggling to maintain any of the infrastructure. You know, look at the, the art school fiasco. You know, look at the look at the the struggle to keep somewhere like the tramway open. The whole infrastructure that was built up around 1990 is now either operating at you know half capacity or under serious threat. You know, there was even talk of closing the new modern art gallery in in. Buchanan Street, uh, not Buchanan Street, in Queen Street. I mean, that's, you know, this is what has happened. And, and I think um, this is why I said that thing in, 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 the, in one of my sessions about rebelling against austerity, because I think we're, we're, we're in the middle of a crisis which is going to change everything. You know, we're talking about the dangers of the fringe coming back exactly as it was before, but what we may find ourselves confronting is a situation where the fringe doesn't come back at that level at all. And we have to deal with a much diminished event. We just don't know what's going to happen, you know? And likewise, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of government spending and finance. You know, it may be that we're looking at a decade where a far bigger chunk of the economy is dependent on government spending to survive. And if that's the case, then it's a threat, but it's also an opportunity because you can begin to be more flexible about where that government spending goes. So we're dealing with an awful lot of sort of unknown unknowns at the moment. Um, and we could be facing a situation where actually high government spending becomes the norm. And our job will be to try and get it put in directions which are really creative and supportive, you know, for, for people in Edinburgh and in cities across the country. Yeah, thanks for making those points, um, Josh, because that was what I was going to go on to about how COVID has changed things. <laughs> yeah. We're very short on time, so I, I want two very quick questions. Um, can I repeat the question of the day? Whose festival is it anyway? It's ours. But the best <laughs> thing that could have happened to Edinburgh uh, from a festival point of view is the great reset of what's happened over the course of the last year. We'd lost, we'd lost the festival. It had become something that, we, that was put upon us. And uh, uh, Joyce is absolutely right. What we have now is an opportunity to take, oh God, take back control, where have we had that before? <laughs> but we need to. Um, it couldn't continue the way it was. We didn't want it to continue, um, uh, people on this call. I think. And uh, we now have an opportunity to change things. And, you know, I think, um, you, you know, kudos to you and Terry for organising this. I think it is shameful the council are not on this discussion today. And um, they should be organising this. This is the opportunity to, through this technology that we've got now, to have these big conversations. We could be having a weekly conversation about aspects, areas of this. But um, it's our festival and we want it back. Yeah, um, I think Edinburgh Festival has always belonged to Edinburgh and the world. Um, it, it, it was put upon us in the first place, but we took to it. 
Um, the fringe grew up around it out of a sort of community response to it and a very Scottish response to it initially. Um, so I think it, it's a city, it's a festival for the city and the world. And it's the, it's the thing that in this post-war era has linked our city to the world. Now, obviously, we don't need the, those links in the same intense physical way now as we did then because of all the new communications that we have. But I still think it's a vital sort of creative um, energy link between Edinburgh and the rest of the world. Um, and I want it to survive and thrive. But I think for it to survive and thrive, we have to have some really fresh thinking about the relationship between the global and the local. How much of our global interaction can we now do without the travelling and the big carbon footprint? How much travelling and actually going and being in other places is really necessary to keep those links alive? Some of it will be necessary, but how much and why? You know, we have to have some original thinking about that. And on the other end, if we want our festivals here to have a really strong local root and strength, then I think we have to stop thinking about um, the festival city as, as, as a business of having a festival in every month of the year to attract people and keep tourism going and all that, and think more deeply about having a festival city which has a festival month or maybe a couple of festival months in the year, but which uses that for, to, to make the city a vibrant place for the rest of the year in terms of everyone in the city's involvement in, in cultural life and in self-expression. Um, and, you know, if we can do that, if we can rethink the local and rethink the global and link them better, then we will have, you know, really, you know, uh, made the, 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 the crisis of this pandemic into an opportunity. Yeah, yeah. To both of you, some absolutely brilliant finale there from, <laughs> from both of you. So at that point, because we are slightly over time, um, with many thanks also to everybody who's taken part, I just hand over to Terry to, to do a final wrap up. And uh, again, thanks very sincerely to, to everybody who's taken part. Uh, well, thank you very much, Cliff. And I'm sitting here in awe of that kind of final summation of what's been a, a really spectacular event. When we set out to kind of do this, it was really to ask the question, you know, uh, what, what do we need to do? How do we need to think this going forward? And it's it's proven to be spectacular in terms of the contributions that uh, the three of you made, but in particular, Stephen and Joyce yourselves. But with all of the panelists, it's been been absolutely brilliant. Um, and the, the chat and the ideas that have come through from, from the audience uh, participating has been brilliant as well, just kind of following a lot of it. So there's, there's a lot of, of creative material to kind of build upon. Um, and I think it really just comes down to um, expressing, first of all, uh, the Coburn's kind of thanks to both yourself, Stephen and Joyce for giving up your time on this Saturday um, to, to chair the, the, the morning and afternoon sessions because you've done it just brilliantly. Um, and the event is a success because of what you've done. So thank you very much. But also, uh, I would invite all the kind of attendees in a virtual way, you know, just even in your front room to kind of thank all of the panelists who I think each and every one of them has contributed, mm -hmm. contributed to a, a really thoughtful, fascinating set of discussions across the piece. Uh, and I get the feeling that we will need to have more of these conversations going through the kind of year. And if we can play a part in helping facilitate some of those, that it's something that we're, we, we are here to do um, and, and we will carry forward. So it would be remiss of me not to kind of end up by saying that um, what we would really seriously hope for those of you who are still with us and attending is please consider kind of joining the Coburn. You can go onto our website, um, and become a member, or please think of giving a donation. It does cost money, just as with all of the cultural organizations as well. Um, or even if just on the spur of the moment, you can send us a donation by texting Edinburgh 70085. That's Edinburgh 770085. Um, we would certainly appreciate your support. Uh, and it just uh, is my final task again to thank everybody, thank all of the attendees for, for giving up their time. Um, the festivals, I think, at the end of it, are part of Edinburgh. Uh, they're essential to kind of all of us in terms of not only the city, but also our own cultural well-being. Um, but it's about reflecting and creating a product going forward that yes. will work kind of with us and for us.
Exactly. Thank you very much. Thanks to the Coburn for a really wonderful event. It's been so interesting. Thank you very much as well. Um, and uh, wherever you're heading off to, please stay safe um, and follow the rules, I think I have to say as well. That's, that's my Scottish government message to you all. So <laughs> thank you all very much.